Okay, happy Sabbath, everyone. How are you doing so far? Have you been blessed? Amen, amen. All right, well, uh, for the sake of time, now some of you said that you have seen uh, this uh, or heard this presentation before, and um, I just want to warn you that this is not the 38-minute version, if any of you happen to see that. Uh, if you didn't happen to see that, don't worry about what I'm talking about. Um, let's just have a quick word of prayer, and we're going to uh, open the Word of God and see some amazing things. Amen? Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask that you would please speak to us today, Lord. Uh, feed us with the bread of life. And Lord, may our hearts be moved as we look into your wondrous plan of salvation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We are told uh, in the book, uh, Last Day Events, we're told in the book, Last Day Events, that um, under the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in the latter days, <clears throat> thousands will be converted in a day. Uh, the same number that were converted, that were baptized on the day of Pentecost, we are told we will see conversions like that, and we will see them happen with a rapidity that will be breathtaking. So my question for you is, how many of you are looking forward to that time when thousands will be converted in a day? Amen. That will be a powerful time because the Spirit of God will be upon God's people. There we are, thousands in the 11th hour will see and acknowledge the truth. These conversions to truth will be made with a rapidity that will surprise the church, and God's name alone will be glorified. Amen? Amen. So, uh, 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 this is good news, but it also presents a very serious challenge. Because when we reason this through, if thousands will be converted in a day, the question is, what are they going to be converted to? We know that they're going to be converted to the preaching of the three angels' messages. What is the three angels' messages all about? Call it out for me, just give me some answers. The three angels' messages is about judgment. What else? It's about worship. What else? Last day events. Uh, what else? Salvation. Come on, help, help me out here. Is, is uh, the Sabbath included in that? Yeah, yeah. How about uh, the mark of the beast? Is it included in that? How about the 2300-day prophecy? Is it included in that? How about the 1260-day prophecy? The 70-week prophecy? How about the fall of Lucifer from heaven? Yes? How about the sanctuary message? Yes? Well, beloved, listen to me. Listen very carefully. If thousands will be converted in a day to the preaching of the three angels' messages, that seems to indicate, beloved, that you and I must be able to share that whole thing in a day. Don't pass out. <laughs> Whoa, I wasn't expecting that one. <laughs> yes, beloved, if, if these are to be converted in a day, remember, Peter preached one message and 3,000 were converted. And so the question is, how in the world can I uh, get to the place where I can preach the three angels' messages in one day? Is it possible to actually give our entire message, the entire three angels' messages, the entire plan of salvation? Is it possible to do that in just one day? I want to suggest to you that the answer is yes. We're about to do it in about an hour and 15 minutes. We're going to cover the 2300-day prophecy, the 1260-day prophecy, the 70-week prophecy, the fall of Lucifer from heaven. We're going to cover the sanctuary message. We're going to cover the three angels' messages, fear God and give glory to him. We're going to cover the millennium. We're going to cover the second coming. We're going to cover the end of the wicked and earth made new, all in about an hour and some change. Are you excited? All right, so... Um, let me ask you a question, and I always set this message up with this question. How many of you think that um, if I ask you to come up here and explain um, the last movie that you saw? Now, I know that you're a Seventh-day Adventist, so you don't watch TV anymore. But the last movie that you saw, you think you could come up here and explain it in about 20 minutes or so. How many of you think you could do that? Come on, come on, come on, come on, guys. Come on, seriously. How many of you think you could, you could explain a movie that you had seen, whether it was a documentary or whatever it happened to be, you could explain that movie, yeah? Okay? 
Now, if I were to ask you to come up here and explain to us the Bible, <laughs> in about, you know, half an hour or so, how many of you think you could do it? <laughs> okay? This is what we're going to do. Listen, there, there is something very important about the, the analogy I just gave you, and here it is. The reason that we can remember a movie so much is because of the images that have been placed in our minds, right? A picture is worth what? A thousand words. So here's what we're going to do. We're simply going to take images from the Bible. Do you know what a movie is, by the way? Moving pictures. Moving pictures. It's just a bunch of pictures put together, and as you go through them in, with rapidity, it forms a movie. So I have entitled this message, The Blueprint. It's subtitled, Earth's Final Movie. Are you with me? So what we're about to see, beloved, is we're about to watch a movie. Amen? Amen. Now, um, how, many of you, how many of you have ever juiced before? You know what that is, right? When you take a, a, a you know, fruit or vegetable and you, you know, maybe you get like 20 carrots and you juice it down into one cup. That's what we're going to do with the Bible, okay? We're going to juice the entire Bible so that we can cover it. We're going to span the entire great controversy and we're going to do it in such a way that by the grace of God, you will be able to share this message with your friends and your neighbors and your family. How does that sound? Are you ready? All right, so we are going to begin, and I'm going to invite you to use your mind as the screen. You will hear me often say in this presentation, are you with me in your movie? And just simply tell me if you are, just say amen. Are you with me? Amen. All right, our movie begins. Have we prayed? Let's pray again. Heavenly Father, please guide us, give us understanding Teach us, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So, our movie begins with an angel by the name of Lucifer. Now, we understand that heaven was a place of perfect peace and perfect harmony. And uh, uh, all was in harmony to the will of God. In Ezekiel chapter 28, we read about an angel named Lucifer, but he's also called the anointed cherub. Let's read that. Thou art the anointed cherub that, what? Covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created until, what? Iniquity was found in thee. Now, before we go any further, we want to establish a certain point here. Lucifer is called a covering what? Cherub. Now, in order to understand what a covering cherub is, we would have to go, uh, 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 go to the Old Testament where God had given Moses instruction about building something called a sanctuary. I want you to see what the Bible says here. The Bible tells us, uh, uh, speaking about this sanctuary, that it was the example and shadow of heavenly things as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle, for see, saith he, that thou maketh all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. So very simply, what this is uh, showing us is that the Old Testament sanctuary was a pattern or a shadow of what? Heavenly things, okay? So when we go to that Old Testament sanctuary, by the way, there is a picture of the tabernacle. How many of you have seen a picture of this tabernacle before, okay? There's a picture of the tabernacle, and we just want to, for the sake of time, we're going to go right into a place called the Most Holy Place. Now, who can tell me what was in the Most Holy Place? The Ark of the Covenant. And on either side of the Ark of the Covenant, there were two angels, and these angels were called what? Covering angels, or covering cherubs. Listen to what the Bible says here. Thou shalt make a mercy seat of pure gold, and thou shalt make two cherubims of gold, of beaten work shalt thou make them, in the two ends of the mercy seat. And the cherubims shall stretch forth their wings on high, doing what? Covering the mercy seat with their wings. Now, 
uh, we're going to take a picture. Look here at a picture of that ark very close up. Here you have the mercy seat, okay? And then here you had what was called the Ark of the Covenant. Now, let me ask you a question. If this picture is a symbol or shadow of heavenly things, then what do you think that mercy seat represents? God's what? God's throne or God's dominion. All right? So here we have the throne of God. And by the way, in the Old Testament sanctuary, the Shekinah glory sat right on that mercy seat. Who is the Shekinah glory? It's God, okay? So we have God on the mercy seat or his throne. And then the, the, what was holding up the mercy seat? The Ark of the Covenant. If my light will work here. There we go. The Ark of the Covenant. Now, question. What was in the Ark of the Covenant? The law of God, the Ten Commandments. What does that tell us, beloved? That the foundation of God's throne in heaven was his what? Law. Are you with me so far in your movie? Amen. Amen. That's scene number one. The foundation of God's throne was his law. And now if Lucifer was a covering cherub, that would mean that Lucifer's original position in heaven was one of the angels that stood closest in the presence of who? God. God. Very good. Are you with me so far? Amen. All right. Now, the Bible tells us that Lucifer was a covering cherub. Who knows what the word cover means? When you cover something, what are you doing? You are what? You are protecting it. So what was Lucifer's job in heaven? To protect the law of God. Hmm. Now, beloved, this is very important to understand because most Christians do not understand what the great controversy is over. They don't understand what the battle is over. And, and, and it's kind of frustrating when you don't understand. If you don't understand what a battle is over, then you might be fighting on the wrong side without even realizing it. Okay, so what we want to see here is that Lucifer's job was a covering cherub, an angel that was to defend and protect the law of God, which is the foundation of his government and his throne. Does that make sense? You know, if a throne doesn't have law, then what do you have? Anarchy. Now, let's see what happens here. The Bible tells us, the Bible says, we read this before, Ezekiel 28, uh, 14 and onward. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast what? Perfect. Now, why do you think Lucifer was perfect? God created him, but why else was he perfect? Because not only did he protect the law of God, but he kept the law of God. Does that make sense? In other words, you don't protect something that you're not willing to, to keep. But the Bible says that Lucifer was perfect in his ways from the day that he was created until what? Iniquity was found in thee. Now somebody help me out. What is iniquity? Sin. What is the definition of sin according to 1 John chapter 3 verse 4? Transgression of the law. So get this then. Lucifer sinned or transgressed a what? Law. Now, how many of you want to take a wild guess as to what law it was that Lucifer must have transgressed? The very law that he had been commissioned to what? Defend and protect. Are you with me? So watch this then, beloved. When Lucifer sins in heaven, it brings about a war in heaven. Yes? So, here's what we begin to understand, that the very first war, the war that set off all wars, was over the law of God. So, if the first, law was over, if the first war was over the law of God, what do you think the final war is going to be over? Are you with me in your movie so far? All right, so... Uh, so far, so good. The Bible says they have filled the midst of thee with violence and thou hast sinned. Uh, the Bible goes on to say here. 
All right, we've read that verse already. Now, we need to, 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 to ask ourselves another question uh, to advance us in our, in our movie so far, okay? The question is, we, we understand from the Bible that one-third of the angels were cast out of heaven with Lucifer when he started this rebellion. Our question now is to figure out how it is that the devil was able to cast out one or was able to deceive one third of intelligent angels. Now, how many of you said, if I was in heaven, I wouldn't have been deceived? <laughs> Here is a question. How is it that Lucifer was able to deceive one third of the angels? The answer is an amazing one. We're told here in Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 through 14. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, where did he say it? In his heart. I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. Now let me ask you something. What congregation was Lucifer trying to exalt himself over? Congregation of angels. Because this is happening where? In heaven. All right. So it says here, uh, 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 I will uh, ascend, I will sit on the mount of the congregation. By the way, what did Lucifer end up doing to the congregation? He split it. Do you know the first church split <laughs> happened in heaven? And what was it over? The law of God. Look at what it says. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Now, this is absolutely amazing. What is the Most High like? The Most High is loving, is kind, is righteous, is holy. So let's put this together. What was the argument that Lucifer used to deceive intelligent angels? Here's what he said. We don't need a law in order to be holy like God. Okay, we'll try that again. I'll try it over here. Maybe you guys... We don't need a law in order to be holy like God. In other words, it was an argument of self-righteousness. I don't need God to tell me how to be holy. I don't need a law to tell me how to be righteous. I am already holy. I don't need to obey God's commandments. He doesn't have the market on righteousness. We are already holy. It was an argument of self-righteousness. So Lucifer did not say to the angels, hey, angels, would you like to be evil? How many angels would have gone for that? Evil, hmm, destroy heaven and... Um, hmm. No, that wouldn't have been deception. Lucifer's argument was, look, we don't need God telling us how to be righteous. I want you to imagine the depth of this deception. Um, do we have any Democrats in here? Don't raise your hand, please. Please, don't do that. Here's why I don't want you to raise your hands. Because Republicans, do we have any Republicans in here? Republicans, go ahead, raise your hand. Yeah. You know, Republicans, you know that the Democrats are, they're just being worked by Satan. We know that, right? Yeah, yeah. All right, Republicans. Democrats, you know I was just kidding, right? <laughs> we know that it's the Republicans that is just destroying America. We know that, right? Yeah, yeah, we know. <laughs> It, isn't it amazing how both Republicans and Democrats think that they're doing what's best for the country? So I want you to imagine the kind of, of, of politicking that was going on in heaven. Lucifer was a politician saying, listen, God's government and his ways need reforming. He wanted to change, what word? Change the government of God. He wanted to do away with the law of God. And here was his argument. Please don't stone me. His argument was this. Too much big government. <laughs> we don't need God telling us every area what we need, what we're going to do, and how we're going to. We don't need God telling us, intruding in every area of our lives. That was his argument. Let us be the rugged, let us do our own thing. Self-sufficiency. 
Wow. Where have I heard that? <laughs> Where have you heard that before, right? So, beloved, I want you to understand that the angels didn't say, oh, let's just go be evil. They were at first, even Lucifer himself didn't realize what he was doing. Now he is obviously evil. But at then, he was genuinely thinking, I can be righteous without God. Now, let me ask you a question. Have you heard that argument anywhere here on planet Earth before? That we don't need a law in order to be like God? We don't need a law in order to be like Christ. We can be holy and righteous without God telling us how to do it. Have you ever heard that before? It's an argument that was born out of the heart and mouth of Satan himself. Are you with me in your movie so far? All right, so what happens? The Bible tells us that there is what? War in heaven and the devil and his angels are cast out. Now... Uh, we need to ask ourselves a question. Why is it that God, that God did not immediately judge or destroy Lucifer and his angels? Have you ever asked yourself that question? All right, so here's what we're going to find out. The answer is a profound one. It's found in Deuteronomy chapter 19, verses 16 and 17. Here's what the Bible says. God is laying out a principle, and uh, he's speaking to Moses, and here's what it says. If a false witness rise up against any man to testify against him that which is wrong, then both the men between whom the controversy is shall stand before the Lord, before the priests and the judges, which shall be in those days, and the judges shall make diligent inquisition. Now, basically what it was telling us here is that whenever controversy arose between two people, there had to be a third party. Are you with me so far? You know, if you have an issue with someone and you try to take that person to court and you go to court and you know you're going to win that case and then uh, when they say all rise, the judge is walking in, the judge happens to be the guy you're taking to court. What do you know? There's no way you're going to win this trial, right? So think about it. Let's take this principle. It's a very fair principle. In heaven, how many sides were there to the rebellion? Two. Two. God and his angels, the devil and his angels. Where is the third party? There is no third party. Do you see the dilemma? Do you see the dilemma? Are you with me in your movie so far? <laughs> you guys are glued to the screens. <laughs> All right, so, so what is God going to do? How is it, what, what is the, in fact, here's something interesting. The Bible tells us in Ezekiel 28, verse 17, as Lucifer is being cast out of heaven, Ezekiel 28, 17 says something interesting. It says, thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. Very interesting phrase. I will lay you before kings. The term appears to be synonymous with some kind of judgment. Like God was saying to Lucifer, I'm going to lay you before a group of kings that are going to judge you. The question is, who would those kings be? Are you with me in your movie so far? <laughs> I want you to notice what the Bible says, Revelation 1, 5, and 6, and from Jesus Christ, who was a faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from, his own, from our sins in his own blood and has made us what? Kings and priests unto God and to his father. So guess what, beloved? Who would be those kings? Who would be that third party that judges Lucifer? Us. Wow. Amen. What a high calling. Amen. What, I, what, I, what I like to say, beloved, is that, is that you are God's jury. Amen. Amen. <laughs> you are his jury. Beloved, let me, can I warn you? Some, can I? Don't skip jury duty. That will not be a good thing if you skip jury duty. By the way, only jurors will be saved. We'll come back to that. We'll come back to that. Listen. Uh, uh, um, the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians 6, 2 and 3, Do you not know that the what? Saints shall do what? Judge the world and if the world shall be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Know you not that we shall judge angels are you with me so far are you with me in the movie do you see this 
Is it making sense so far? Amen. Very good. So we, when God created Adam and Eve, they were to serve as the jurors. They were the kings. In other words, humanity was going to be the juror. In fact, when God created Adam and Eve, what did he give them? He gave them dominion. Who has dominion but a king? Watch this. When jurors are selected, there are usually some criteria in order to be a juror. Notice criteria number one. Little or no first-hand knowledge of the crime. Let me ask you something. Where was humanity when Lucifer rebelled in heaven? We weren't even created. So far, so good. Are you ready for this one? Point number two, a juror must be a law-abiding citizen. <laughs> Are you going to make me get excited all by myself? Just up here alone? Are you going to leave me lonely up here? <laughs> So, so, uh, 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 jurors must be law-abiding citizens. We know that when God created Adam and Eve, he created them with the law of God written upon their hearts. Very good, okay? Number three, a juror must have sound discernment between good and evil. And number four, they must not be swayed by public opinion. So watch what happens. Lucifer sees the creation of Adam and Eve, and he begins to wonder, okay, are these, huh, are these the ones that ought to judge me? Is this the jury that's supposed to bring me into condemnation? And you know what he does? Let me ask you, if you were a criminal and you had access to the jury, what would you try to do? Oh, yeah. Bribe the jury. <laughs> and guess what Lucifer does? Just that. He comes to Eve in the garden, and he says, uh, The servant said unto the woman, You shall not surely die. Uh, you know, after he asked her, you know, Did God say you can't eat from every, every tree? Notice what he says. For God does know that in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. You shall be as gods. You shall be like God. Does that sound familiar? How did he deceive the angels in heaven? We can be like God without obeying what he says. The very same thing. He didn't go to Eve and say, hey, Eve, would you like to be evil? <laughs> no, 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 no. He said, Eve, you can be like God. Now, by the way, the word God is the Hebrew Elohim, which means judges, Eve. You want to be a really good judge? You want to really know the difference between good and evil? Eat from this tree, and then you'll be a really good judge. Whoa. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> so, Adam and Eve, they both eat of the fruit, and what happens? They lose their status as law-abiding citizens of the kingdom of heaven. Jesus comes to the garden, and what do we know? That he institutes the plan of salvation. So now you tell me, what must, what must be the purpose of the plan of salvation? To restore mankind to being law-abiding citizens and sound jurors who are able to discern between right and wrong. Guess what? you now understand the entire purpose of the gospel. The Lord. It is to restore us to being citizens of the kingdom of heaven. And by the way, the only way that we can be uh, citizens of the kingdom of heaven is if we are willing to be subject to heaven's laws. You see, beloved, what we're doing as we study with our, with our friends and our neighbors is we've got to set a foundation for them so that they can understand the, what we share them in further studies. They can understand it in light of the big picture. If they don't see the big picture, 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 
We've got to hang this in memory's hall. Are you with me? All right, so are you with me in your movie so far? All right, now, what we're going to do now is we're going to fast forward a little bit because God has already shown us that he's going to come and, and set a plan in place to restore mankind, okay? And we'll fast forward, and we're going to come down now to the time of Moses. God is about to use a man named Moses. He's about to take a people out of captivity, and who are those people? They are the children of Israel, okay? And God calls the children of Israel because he's evidently going to use them as part of his plan to restore mankind to being what? Sound jurors, law-abiding citizens of the kingdom of heaven. So what does God do when he calls Israel out of captivity? He gives them a very special gift. What is that gift? It is the sanctuary. Now, I want to share something with you. The Bible says here, Exodus 25, verse 8, Let them make me a what? Sanctuary that I may do what? Dwell among them. Listen, why is this so important? Um, in fact, let's look at another verse very quickly. Psalm 77, 13 says, Thy what? Way, O God, is where? In the sanctuary. Now, pause right now. Um, when, Mo when God came to Adam and Eve in the garden, what was the first question he asked them? Adam, where, where are you? Now, did God not know where Adam was? He knew where he was. What was he trying to get Adam to realize? That you are what? Lost. You are lost. Because of man's rebellion, they were put out of the garden, right? Right? God's plan is to bring man back into his presence. So what does he do? He gives them a map. You're going to make me get excited. Oh, you're going to do this, aren't you? aren't you? He gives them a map. He gives them something called a sanctuary, which, by the way, is a miniature model of God's throne room where? In heaven. So the very same thing. In other words, it's like God saying, listen, if you want to know how my government operates, if you want to be subject to my government in heaven, I'm going to give you a miniature model on earth. <laughs> it's what I call, by the way, how many of you have ever been lost? And um, have you ever, like, you know, asked someone, pull over, asked someone for directions, and they're like, oh, yeah, sure. You know, you're in a strange place like Hawaii, let's say. <laughs> and, uh, you know, you're trying to get to, you know, I don't know, Sharks Cove. And they're like, oh, yeah, you know, all you need to do is just go down the street, make a right here, and then a left there, and then just keep going, and, ah, you'll be right there. <laughs> and the guy looks nice. He looks like a friendly guy, and so you trust him. You, you put all your hopes, aspirations, just believing that he is right. <laughs> and you, you go off driving, and you make the left and the right, and you do exactly what he said, and you end up someplace else. <laughs> oh, the frustration, right? Have you ever had that happen to you? Oh, what if we had a GPS that was just so accurate we could know all the time, oh, I'm here and I know exactly where I need to go. Beloved, the sanctuary is God's GPS, his gospel plan of salvation. You cannot get lost if you have this blueprint. God has given it to us so that we can know the way back to the Father. Amen? So how do you think the devil feels about this blueprint? Oh, yeah, he must hate. Are you with me in your movie so far? He must hate this thing because God takes the very thing in heaven. He makes a replica of it and sends it down to earth. And the devil's probably going, oh, look, it's down here on earth. And then he hears God speaking to Israel about the sanctuary. And he understands that God has given the sanctuary to Israel to prepare the world for the coming of the Messiah. This sanctuary contains the plan of salvation to save the whole world. How do you think Satan feels about that? Oh, he's angry. And he realizes he's got to do something. But beloved, before we go there in our movie, you and I need to understand the importance of this blueprint. Are you ready? Yes. All right, so here we go. 
Oh, uh, 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 ooh, okay, all right. I'm sorry, I just had to get excited by myself for a moment. All right, so listen to this. The sanctuary reveals the presence of God. Now, you'll remember that God said to Moses, let them make me a what? Sanctuary that I may do what? Dwell among them. So as you look at the outer tent of this sanctuary, it was just regular covering, you know, like a, just a plain brown covering. Nothing attractive on the outside. But on the very inside of that temple was the very presence of who? God. Do you know that the sanctuary reveals Jesus Christ? Jesus said when he came, Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will do what? I will raise it up. Then said the Jews, Forty and six years was his temple in building. Will thou rear it up in three days? But he spake of the temple of his what? Body. You see, beloved, when Jesus came to this earth, who knows what his name was called? Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son. They shall call his name what? Emmanuel, meaning what? God with us. You see, as you looked at that baby, nothing spectacular, just looked like a regular baby. But inside that child was the very presence of God. Are you with me? All right, so you're sharing this with your friends and your neighbors, and they're going, wow, I never knew that about the sanctuary. Are you with me? Look at what it goes on to tell us. Jesus said, verily, verily, I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door of the sheepfold or into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber, but he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. Do you realize that's the door he's talking about? Jesus, is, is, he says, I'm the one that walks through that door, and he walks through that door because he is the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. He said, Pastor, lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Listen, right up here in that outer court of the sanctuary, there was something called the altar of sacrifice. You know what happened there? Animals were sacrificed. What does that point to? It points to Jesus Christ. He walks through the door, and through the door, he goes to that sacrifice. So Jesus says, listen to this, the Bible tells us, To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. When he putteth forth his own voice, he goeth before them, and the sheep do what? Follow him. So, beloved, listen, if Jesus is in the sanctuary, if he walks in the sanctuary, then what will his followers be found doing? following him in that pattern are you with me jesus says i am the way but psalm says thy way O god is in the sanctuary." that means jesus is in the sanctuary are you with me all right let's see how else this sanctuary points to the plan of salvation now here, is, here are the articles of furniture, and I just need you to help me out here. Most of you should know this, so help me out. In the outer court is what we call the altar of what? Sacrifice. And then uh, if you moved up a little bit further, you would see an article of furniture called the laver. That's where the priest would do what? Wash their hands and their feet because they were either mingled with blood or dirt. Please, don't lose this here, okay? Uh, what about the uh, table of showbread? This, by the way, was a, a compartment called the, the tabernacle proper, and it was a two-compartment room divided by a curtain, okay? So in the holy place, that's the first compartment, there were three articles of furniture. There was a seven-branch candlestick, and what did that seven-branch candlestick, what do you think that represents? Well, it represents light. It represents light. In fact, Jesus said, ye are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hid. So that seven-branch candlestick represents the people of God, the light of the world. We are supposed to be like a city set on a hill. Are you with me? What do you think the, the uh, labor represents? Water. It represents what? Baptism. What do you think the altar of sacrifice represents? The death of Christ. What do you think the table of showbread represents? Man shall not live by what? Bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. How about the altar of incense? 
Altar of incense represents prayer. According to Revelation chapter uh, 8, verses 1 through 3, that incense, you know how incense just rises? You burn it and it rises? Just like our prayers. When we pray, it rises to God. Amen? All right, so you have the altar of incense, and then you went into the most holy place, and there you had the Ark of the Covenant, the two angels, the covering cherubs, the mercy seat, and the very presence of God. Are you with me? Now, I want you to watch this here. Uh, we have the altar of sacrifice, we have the laver, we have the table of showbread, the altar of incense, the seven branch candlestick, and the Ark of the Covenant. Now, do you realize that if you were to trace around these articles, just draw an outline around the articles, do you know that you would find a cross? You're really going to make me get excited. Alone, up here. Thousands of years before Christ would come upon the scene, the sanctuary pointed to the fact that he would die on a cross for our sins. Not only that, beloved, but if you look a little bit further, you will notice that in every place that an article of furniture is, Jesus was wounded. How? Jesus had, was nailed in his feet. He was nailed in the left hand, nailed in the right hand, a crown of thorns on his head, He died from a broken heart. And do you know what happened when the Roman soldiers came to him to see if he was dead? They took a spear and pierced his side. And guess what came out? Water and blood. Just as the priests, whose hands mingled with blood, would wash at the laver, Every article of furniture points to a place in which Christ was wounded. Amen. What are the odds? What are the odds? How about this? The sanctuary points to the fact of who Christ is. We know, beloved, that Christ is the Lamb of God. Are you with me? Yeah. Altar of what? Sacrifice. Not only is he the Lamb of God, he is the water of life. <laughs> Amen. Are you with me? Amen. Not only is he the water of life, beloved, he is the bread of life. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> He's the bread of life. Not only that, beloved, he is our intercessor. Not only is he our intercessor, he is the light of the world. And beloved, if that weren't enough, he is the law of God personified. Do you see how important this blueprint is? Let's do some more. Christ, or I'm sorry, we're going to look at the Exodus, and we're going to notice that Christ delivers his people through this pattern. You say, how, Pastor? Listen, in the Exodus, the first thing that God commanded the children of Israel to do was what? They were to kill a lamb. What article of furniture are we looking at? The altar of sacrifice. That's the Passover. You with me so far? Amen. Okay, next. After the Passover, the children of Israel go and they are confronted with the Red Sea. Amen. 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 Do, do you see this? What does the Red Sea symbolize? Baptism. Baptism. After the Red Sea is parted and they cross over the Red Sea, the Bible says in the very next chapter, chapter 16, the Bible tells us that God rains down manna from heaven. Do you think that's a coincidence? Do you see what God is doing here? He's leading the children of Israel through a pattern. Watch this. In Exodus chapter 17, or I think it's Exodus chapter 19, God says to Israel, Israel, you are now my royal nation, my peculiar treasure, my city set on a hill. He is referring them, he is referring to the seven branch candlestick. He is about to use Israel as the light to the whole world. In that same chapter, God tells Moses to tell the children of Israel to take three days to prepare themselves to meet God. 
What article of furniture are we looking at? The altar of incense. Heart preparation. Why? Because in Exodus chapter 20, You thought I was making this up? <laughs> Exodus chapter 20, what happens? God speaks the commandments to his people. Do you think this is coincidence? Absolutely not, beloved. All right, we're going to run through some more. I just want you to get this blueprint nailed down. I want this picture needs to be hanging in memory's hall. Are you with me? Repetition deepens the impression okay so let's look at another one let's look at a couple more here Christ's life this is beautiful where was Christ born Bethlehem. but where in Bethlehem in a stable what's in the stable animals Christ was born among animals what article of furniture would you point to to represent Christ born among animals the altar of sacrifice. We might say that Christ was born a living sacrifice. He was born to die. At the age of 30, what happens to Christ? He's baptized. That's the labor. Question, what happens after Christ is baptized? The Bible says he is led up into the wilderness. How many times is Christ tempted in the wilderness? How many articles of furniture do we have? <laughs> What's the first temptation? <laughs> Turn this stone into what? Bread. Do you think the devil is aware of this blueprint? I mean, you think this is coincidence? Okay, watch this. Temptation number two. He says, throw yourself down from this cliff and call out to God. He's trying to tempt Jesus to offer a presumptuous prayer. The altar of incense. Temptation number three. He says, look, I know you came for your people. I know you've come to redeem your people. I'll give you your seven branch candlestick if you just bow down and worship me. Jesus overcomes all three temptations and he goes on to preach the law of God combined with the mercy of God. Amen? Amen. Are you with me in your movie so far? Very good. Okay, just please, just, just, let's just do a couple more. Let's look at this. Christ descends from heaven. The pattern even shows Christ's descent. Watch. Christ left his throne in heaven. Uh-huh. Yes, do you see that? All right. He left his throne in heaven. He lived off of the word of God. Table of showbread. He let his light shine. John 1, 9. Altar of uh, seven branch candlestick. And he lived a life of prayer. Altar of incense. He was baptized. And then, crucified. Which way do you want it? <laughs> I just kind of like, you know, just like wallowing in the wow. All right, all right. So, uh, uh, how about this? Um, <clears throat> Christ. Ascension. Christ came to this world and died. Altar of sacrifice. He was resurrected and purified. Labor. Right? He enters into the heavenly sanctuary ministering among the seven branch candlesticks. Ministering. He ascended to give manna from heaven. He ascended to intercede on our behalf. And one day in the future, we knew that Christ would enter into the most holy place to begin the work of judgment. Amen? All right. All right. Very good. Um, how about this?
Do you know that the, even the New Testament is based upon the pattern? Check this out. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. What are they about? It's the gospel. But what is it about? It's about the life, death, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the four Gospels. It's about the sacrifice of Christ. What's next in the Bible? The book of Acts. What is the book of Acts all about? The baptism of the Holy Spirit. Okay, you're going to make me get excited. Alone. So the book of Acts is about baptism. All right, now we have Romans to Jude. What does Romans, from Romans to the book of Jude, what does it talk about? I tell you, it talks about the importance of the word of God. It talks about the importance of, of Christ's intercession and prayer. It talks about the importance of letting your light shine. And then we get to the book of Revelation, <laughs> which brings you into the very throne room of God. Okay, well, maybe the silence is because you're just watching a really good movie and you don't want to be disturbed right now. So I'll leave you alone, and let's just keep watching the movie. Okay. All right. So um, let's see here. Uh, uh, yeah, let's do one more. This is very important, beloved. Our path. If we've seen the path in all these different ways, we, we must realize that our path to the throne of God follows the same pattern. So if I want to be saved, if I want to come to Christ, what is the first thing that I must do? I must accept the sacrifice of Christ on my behalf. Amen? Amen? That is the first step in the path to the throne of God. Now, if you are, are not a Christian, if you're out there in the world and, and, and the devil knows that the first step is the altar of sacrifice, he's got like 10 demons right here like linebackers trying to stop you from breaking through to that article of furniture. Do you understand what I'm saying? But let's say by the grace of God, you break through those 10 demons and you accept Christ at the cross. You can now go, I made it. It's over. It's finished. I can go home now. Why do you know no? <laughs> because the blueprint tells us so. You see, beloved, when people don't have a blueprint, you kind of don't know where you're going. If you don't have a GPS, you kind of just guesstimate. But when you have something that shows with clarity the path, you can know for sure. If someone says to you, hey, it was all finished at the cross, what can you say to them? Wait a minute. I have asked friends, I've done this study with people who believe once saved, always saved, or that it was all finished at the cross. And when I get here, and then they look at them, they go, no, it can't be done at the cross. Do you see what's happening here? When you, when you get a person to understand and accept this blueprint, it's going to obviously lead somewhere. <laughs> All right, so after I'm baptized, if I'm, gen if I'm a genuine Christian and I accept Christ's sacrifice, what's the next thing that I must do if I'm genuine? I'm going to be baptized. And listen, beloved, if there were 10 demons standing before the altar of sacrifice and you broke through, guess how many there are standing before the, uh, the, the, the laver? There are 20. Don't let them advance. Don't let her advance. But by the grace of God, you break through and you get baptized. Praise God. I have accepted Christ and I've been baptized. Woo, it's done, over with, finished. I'm ready to go. I'm good. No, beloved. Why? Because a genuine Christian will be found doing what? Studying the word of God. Amen? A genuine Christian is going to be found praying and interceding and accepting Christ's intercession on their behalf. A genuine Christian is going to let his or her light what? Shine. So if there were 20 demons trying to stop you from baptism, then there are 60 demons trying to stop you from studying the Bible, witnessing, and praying. So question, where is God ultimately trying to lead us? Yeah. Do you see how obvious the pattern is? When someone says, we don't need to keep the law, they're saying it because they're giving you directions without a blueprint. And they may be genuine. They may look nice. 
But don't put your hopes and aspirations in man. Put it in God. And God has given us a blueprint for a reason. To show us that anyone who seeks to come through any other way than through the door, and those who refuse to follow the Lamb in the steps that he himself walked, they're simply out to get you lost. They may not realize it, but that's what the devil's trying to do. All right, so, oh, I love this one. <laughs> do you know that we're told that Jesus is going to come through the Orion? Take a look at that. That's the Orion. I'm just going to wait. <laughs> Here's what's interesting. This is the Orion Nebula. Do you know what a nebula is? It's a place where stars are born. Okay. No. 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 Let's move on. Let's move on. Let's move on. All right, so Israel has been commissioned to take this blueprint into all the world. Are you with me in your movie so far? What happens is that the way I like to compare it is that God gives Israel this blueprint like it were a football. And he says to Israel, Israel, take it down the field. And off Israel goes with this blueprint, right? But what happens? You see, Israel, that God has called and commissioned to be prepared for the coming of the Messiah, they begin to fumble the ball. They begin to worship idols and, and, and bow down before images. And they're doing all these kinds of things. And they're doing it so much so that God allows them to go into Babylonian captivity. It's like he says, time out, Israel. You get your benched. <laughs> Penalty box. <laughs> Israel has to sit in captivity for how long? Seventy years in Babylonian captivity. Just towards the end of that Babylonian captivity, there is a prophecy given to a prophet by the name of Daniel. And the prophecy states that there would be 70 weeks. Now, let me pause here because we're, here's what we've just done. We've just gone all from Genesis. We're now in the book of Daniel. Okay? And Daniel is given the first of three time prophecies. How many time prophecies? Three. What are those three time prophecies? They are the 70 weeks, the 1260 years, and the 2300 years. Now, how many of you have ever been confused about those prophecies? Kind of, you know, like, what are they really about? Well, listen, very simple. These three time prophecies are really only one prophecy. Do, do you get that? So, so let me break it down for you if I can. Uh, uh, these three prophecies are simply subsections of a larger prophecy. 70 weeks of that prophecy deals with a certain thing. 1260 years of that prophecy deals with a, a certain thing. And then the 2300 years, which is the big picture, deals with something else. Do you have that so, do you have that so far? All right, so we're going to break these three prophecies down very quickly. Prophecy number one is the 70 week prophecy. Now, I wanted to throw this in here because I just want you to, this is, this is beautiful. The 70 weeks, how many days in a week? Seven. So 70 times seven would equal 490 days, okay? But in Bible prophecy, a day equals a year. I want you to notice what John Gill, the Baptist scholar, said. He said, this space of 70 weeks is not to be understood of weeks of days, which is too short for a time for the fulfillment of so many events as are mentioned, nor were they fulfilled within such a space of time, but of weeks of what? Years and make up 490 years, within which time, beginning from a date after mentioned, all the things prophesied were accomplished, and this way of reckoning of years by days is not unusual in the sacred writings. So here is a Baptist scholar laying out the principle for a day for a year. You with me so far? All right, so what was to happen in the 70-week prophecy? Very simple. God basically said to Israel, Israel, you have 70 weeks or 490 
years to get it together. The Messiah is coming at the end of that time. If you do not get it together by the end of the 490 years, I'm going to take the blueprint from you and I'm going to give it to somebody else. Are you with me so far? Well, what happens? Jesus comes on the scene. By the way, this 70-week prophecy covers a time span from Babylon. Do you know how many nations rose and, fall, ro rose and fell before or during the 70-week prophecy? You should know. Four. The prophecy was given towards the end of what, of what empire? The Babylonian Empire. Medo-Persia came upon the scene and fell. Greece came upon the scene and fell. And the 490, or 490 years brings us down to the time of Jesus, which is in what empire? The Roman Empire. Okay? Do you know that the Bible speaks about these four kingdoms in Daniel chapter 7? What are those kingdoms? You remember that? Babylon, the lion, uh, Medo-Persia, the bear, Greece, the leopard, uh, and the, that fourth beast representing Rome. Okay, this is just review for us. Don't, don't get lost. This is just review, right? So the, 70, the 490 years takes us through four kingdoms and brings us down to the time of Rome, right? What happens when Jesus comes on the scene? The Jews do what? They reject Jesus. And in rejecting Jesus, what also did they reject? The blueprints. How? They rejected the Lamb of God. Yes? They rejected the water of life. Yes? They rejected the bread of life. Remember that? Give us his flesh to eat. What? Remember that? They rejected his prayer of forgiveness on the cross. They rejected the light of the world. They comprehended it not, the Bible says. And ultimately, in rejecting him, they rejected his law. They rejected the sanctuary, and therefore God says, okay, you don't want the sanctuary? I will take it from you, and I'm going to give it to another people. Amen. You remember what happened when Jesus died? The veil in the temple was what? Ripped. What did that mean? The earthly temple was of no more what? value because Christ had now ascended or was about to ascend into a heavenly temple. Israel rejects the Messiah and God raises up a new people. Who are those people? Spiritual Israel. All right, beloved, we've just gone through the whole Old Testament. Are you with me so far? You have just watched the movie that has taken you through the whole theme of the New Testament. The whole Old Testament was simply Satan trying to destroy Israel and the blueprint that they possessed. That was it. So we're now at this transition where we read, you are now a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in times past were not a people, but are now what? The people of God. So watch what happens. Israel gets down to the 50-yard line with the blueprint. You know what they do when Jesus comes? They fumble the ball. God takes the blueprint from them and he hands it to spiritual Israel. And off they go down the field. Are you with me so far? What is their message? Their message is about a risen Savior in a heavenly what? Temple. Are we good? All right, now let's move on. Remember this. Who is the devil now going to use to attack the early church? The same kingdom, Rome. Rome, that, the same Rome that put Christ to death, began to persecute the early church. You ever read about that? You know, the Christians being thrown to the lions and stuff like that? Well, guess what happens? The more Christians die, the more they what? They multiply. So Satan realizes this tactic is not working. So he has to come up with another power, a power that rises after Rome. Are you with me? This power he's going to use to attack spiritual Israel and also attack the heavenly sanctuary. Watch this. In the book of Daniel, 
The book of Daniel speaks of the power that rose after Rome. It says, I was considering the horns on the, the fourth beast, which represents Rome, and there was another horn, a little one, that came up among them. Who does that little horn represent? It represents the church of the dark ages. Watch this. The Bible says, or rather, Adam Clark, who is a Methodist, says this. In prophetic language, a time signifies a year, and the prophetic year has a year for each day. The three years and a half, a day standing for a year, will amount to 1,260 years. This is a Methodist speaking. Are you with me? I'm just showing you the, the how. This is not an Adventist interpretation, beloved. We have built upon those that came before us. Are you with me? All right, so watch this. Uh, uh, the 1260 days is actually 1260 years. And that is a time that we are told that this little horn would dominate or would attack the people of God and the sanctuary of God. In fact, here's what the Bible says. The Bible tells us in a few places. Uh, in Daniel chapter 8, verse 12, it says the daily sacrifice would be taken away. What article of furniture are we looking at? Daily sacrifice. Altar of sacrifice. Very good. It also says in Daniel chapter 8, verse 12, it casts down the truth to the ground. Where can we find the truth? Thy word is truth. Very good. According to Daniel chapter 7, verse 25, it would wear out or persecute the saints of the Most High. What article of furniture represents the saints of the Most High? The seven branch kept very good. Are you, are you guys following this? In other words, we can know who this power is simply by looking at how it would attack these truths taught by the heavenly sanctuary. Watch this. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3 and 4, the Bible says of this power that he would show himself that he is God. Where would that point to? Very good. It also says in Daniel chapter 7, 25, that he would think to change times and laws. Where would that point to? Six. Very good. So we know what we're looking for. Watch this. Did a power rise upon the scene that attacked each one of these articles? The answer is a resounding yes. Notice this. The Roman Catholic system replaced or cast down the truth of Christ's sacrifice and replaced it by teaching indulgences. In other words, the sacrifice of Christ is not sufficient for the forgiveness of sins. You have to buy to be forgiven. Beloved, this was a direct attack upon the very purpose Christ came to die. People were buying forgiveness instead of going to Jesus Christ. Not only did they attack this truth during the Dark Ages, they also attacked the truth, let me read this very quickly, through the Eucharist. It says the power of the priest is the power of the divine person for the transubstantiation of the bread requires as much power as the creation of the world. Thus the priest may be called the creator of the creator. So every time the priest raises that piece of bread and breaks it, what he's saying is that I have the power to crucify Christ again. Woo! Beloved, Christ died once for our sins. Once. So that truth was cast down. Not only was that truth cast down, also the truth about the baptism was cast down as the church began to practice what was called infant baptism. You don't need to confess and repent. We're just going to sprinkle you. You see, beloved, what this did was it did away with the need for confession and repentance, and suddenly, as long as you were sprinkled as a child, you're good. Not only did they cast that truth down, they attacked the word of God. They replaced the word of God, the table of showbread, with the traditions of the church. In fact, here's what they said. They said the traditions of the church are more important than the Bible itself. 
They also said that you are not allowed, you as a lay person are not allowed to possess a Bible because you can't interpret it. Only the priest can interpret it. Beloved, do you know why? Huh. Watch this. Not only did they attack these three things, they also attacked the altar of incense. Christ's mediation was cast down and replaced by something called the confessional booth. Can I tell you something about the confessional booth? The confessional booth is a two-compartment room divided by a curtain. <laughs> With a man sitting in the place of God. While men come and confess their sins before him. Do you think this is coincidence? You see, beloved, it's all in the blueprint. When we understand the blueprint, we will understand the entire plan of salvation. Listen, what's next? Not only did they attack these things, they also attacked the church of God by persecuting the church of God, sending them into hiding, and thus producing, I believe, why, why we call it the dark ages. The way that the church evangelized, was by burning you at the stake. Repent or we'll burn you. And then they reached up into the most holy place and cast down the law of God. How did they do that? Daniel 7.25 says that he would think to do what? Change times and laws. What commandment did the church change? The Sabbath commandment. What are the odds? Beloved, do you see how when you lay this out, when you, you know, if you say to someone, keep the Sabbath, oh, what for? But now when you give them the whole background and show them how the rebellion began in heaven, Lucifer trying to change the law of God, we can now see why he's trying to do the same thing on earth. By the way, not only did they change, only change the law of God, There is the head of the church sitting in between two cherubim. You'll also notice four priests on either side of them. Just like four living creatures surrounded the throne of God. <laughs> Man sitting in the place of God. The Westminster's Confession of Faith, a Presbyterian document, says this, there is no other head of the church but the Lord Jesus Christ, nor can the Pope of Rome in any sense be head thereof, but is that Antichrist. I thought that was only an Adventist thing. Whoa! Is that Antichrist, that man of sin and son of perdition, that exalted himself in the church against Christ and against all that is called God? You see, beloved, the reason I like to bring these into my presentation is to show, look, this is not some weird interpretation by Adventists. This is, this is what Protestantism taught for hundreds of years until they lost their protests. Amen. So, Adam Clark, a Methodist, says this. In prophetic language, a time signifies a year. We read this already. I'm going to pick up to where it says here. The end is probably not very distant. It has already been grievously shaken by the French, talking about the papacy. In 1798, Adam Clark, a Methodist, a, me a what everyone? A Methodist identifies 1798, the French Republican army under General Berthier took possession of the city of Rome and entirely superseded the whole papal power. Wow. 
All right, so what do we have so far? We've just hit the 70 week prophecy, and now we saw the 1260 year prophecy. And what, where are we now in our movie? We see that Satan seems to be winning. But, beloved, you know, in every movie where it seems like the bad guy, <laughs> we know there comes that point in the movie <laughs> where things are going to turn in the favor of good. This, beloved, brings us to the final part of the prophecy of Daniel chapter of, of the book of Daniel, which is a 2300-day prophecy. And I want you to notice what it says. It says, how long shall be the vision concerning the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot? In other words, the angel is asking here a question. How long is this little horn going to be able to do these things and trample upon the truth? And the answer is... Unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be, what everyone? Cleansed. Some translations say restored. In other words, the truths that were cast down during the Dark Ages will be restored by the end of the 2,300 years. When does the 2,300 year prophecy end according to the prophecy? 1844. So if we are right, watch this, if we are right, then what we're going to see is a restoration of all those truths by what year? 1844. Watch this. Listen to this. A Baptist minister, John Gill, listen to what John Gill said about the 2300-day prophecy. This is mind-blowing. These 2300 days may be considered so many years which will bring it down to the end of the sixth millennium or thereabout. When it may be hoped, there will be a new face upon the things upon the sanctuary and the church of God and a cleansing of it from all corruption in doctrine, discipline, worship, and conversation. Okay, I, I, I forgot you're watching a movie, so leave you alone as you're watching. Let's just continue. John Gill, Baptist scholar, says that the 2300 days will bring about a restoration of purity in doctrine and worship. So, let's see. Over a period of 500 years, all of these truths began to be restored. Are you ready for this? This is the highlight of the presentation. Are you ready? You may as well just go ahead and get excited now. Just, just go ahead. Just go ahead. Okay, okay. Watch, watch. Watch your movie. Pay attention. In the 1300s, a man by the name of John Wycliffe comes upon the scene. Anyone know a John Wycliffe? By the way, John Wycliffe is, is the founder of a movement called the Lollards. Now, John Wycliffe, what did he do? He translated the Bible into the, la into the common language of the people. Do you know what article of furniture John Wycliffe effectively restored? The table of showbread. How many of you want to say amen to that? Amen. Now watch this. Do you know that John Wycliffe, how many of you appreciate John Wycliffe? Do you know that if you were living in the 1300s and someone said, hey, you want to be a lowlord? Do you know that you would have been considered a cult? People would have been like, oh, Wycliffe? Whoa! Ho, ho, ho! Hey! <laughs> if you decided to follow Wycliffe's teachings, you would not probably not be able to go home to your neighbors. Your neighbors would look at you funny. In other words, beloved, if you were going to follow Wycliffe in that time, you had to be bold enough to stand for truth. Praise God for John Wycliffe. In the 1400s, another man is born, and by the way, the, as I said, they were persecuted as a cult. In the 1400s, a man by the name of Martin Luther is born, and Martin Luther begins what's known as a Protestant Reformation. Martin Luther is the founder of the Lutheran movement, and guess what Martin Luther restores? He says, wait a minute, we don't have to buy forgiveness. Christ's sacrifice is sufficient for the forgiveness of sins. Amen? Amen? And beloved, if I was living in that time, guess what? I would have been uh, Martin Luther. But guess what? Do you realize that if you were in that time and you said, hey, 
I'm a Lutheran. Do you realize that people would have looked at you as a cult? Do you know, do you know what they, can, if internet was around in the days of Martin Luther, whoo, yeah, I heard that Martin Luther, <laughs> you would have been considered a cult. You had to have boldness and a desire to follow Christ if you were going to stand with truth. And by the way, uh, it's interesting that when Wycliffe had uh, uh, translated the Bible, it was present truth. And then when, Wyc when Martin Luther comes along, by that time, the Bible was already kind of spreading around, not fully. It was still present truth, but it was almost like moving into a little bit of precious truth. We'll come back to that. Martin Luther and the Lutherans were treated as a cult. In the, sick, or in, the same, in the 1500s, another man by the name of John Calvin comes upon the scene. John Calvin is the founder of the Presbyterian movement. And John Calvin has a very special burden for prayer. He's like, we don't need to go to priests and popes to, to get forgiveness of sins. And we can pray directly to God. Calvin effectively restores what, everyone? The altar of incense. Now, if you would have dreamed about being a Calvinist in that day, Following Calvin, a Presbyterian, I should say. You know what you would have been treated as? A cult. Oh, by the way, guess who were the ones that would have treated you like a cult? The Lutherans. You see, the Lutherans, when they discovered their truth, they were like, okay, this is it. I mean, what are they, to, what's he talking about? What are they talking about? We have the truth. We have all there is to have. Luther didn't realize that he was fulfilling part of a bigger picture. In the 1600s, a man by the name of John Smith comes upon the scene. John Smith, along with Roger Williams, become known as the founders of the Baptist movement. Now, let me ask you something. What did the Baptists focus upon? Baptism. Now, can you imagine in that time, you know, if you started talking about baptism by immersion, people would have been like, oh, you're crazy. You are a cult. Don't you know everyone sprinkles? You would have been treated by, like a cult. And guess who would have been treating you as a cult? The Lutherans and the Presbyterians. <laughs> they became friends. Ah, those Baptists, man. Let's get them. Are you seeing a pattern here? <laughs> so the Baptists restore that truth of baptism by immersion. And by the way, people may have been like, you Baptists are just focused on baptism. You know what, beloved? It was present truth for that time. God had given them a present truth, and people who didn't understand, they accused them of just focusing on one thing. No, God had called them into existence for that one reason. Praise God for the Baptists. In the 1700s, a man by the name of John Wesley comes upon the scene. John Wesley, Wesley is the founder of the Methodist movement. <laughs> I think somebody knows where this is going. <laughs> John Wesley has a very special ver burden. He believes that every individual is an evangelist. Everybody's supposed to be a light to the world. And he begins these missionary societies and he's sending people out to evangelize. Uh, uh, John Wesley effectively uh, 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 restores the seven branch candlestick. If you considered being a Methodist in the 1700s, And guess who was persecuting you? The Baptists, the Presbyterians, and the Lutherans. Those crazy Methodists, they eat babies. What? I heard they eat babies. Stay, stay far away from that church. They eat babies. You, could, you, should, you should read the history of some of the things that were said about the, the Methodist church when they came upon the scene. Beloved, listen, this is how the devil attacks truth. The easiest way to attack truth is to simply say, they eat babies. <laughs> They're a cult. They're crazy. They, they require you to stand on your hand for hours at a time during church service. Okay, let's forget that one. All right. 
So, 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 remember, what do we have now, beloved? There is one article of furniture left to be restored. Wow. The prophecy, the 2300 day prophecy ends in what year? 1844. Let me ask you, what are the odds? What are the odds? Are you with me in your movie? <laughs> What are the odds that God would bring a movement into existence at the very end of that time period, 1844? What are the odds? What are the odds? Beloved, can I tell you something? You are not a Seventh-day Adventist by accident. You are a movement that has a prophetic birth certificate. You arrived, you ever, <laughs> oh man, oh man. <laughs> Can I tell you something? There is, uh, <laughs> there was a, a football game, and you got to help me out with this because I'm forgetting it now. There was a football game that was played, it was Cal State and Stanton, Stanford, Stanford. And, and in this game, there was like a... Uh, uh, there was like three seconds left on the clock, okay? And I believe it was Stanford that was up in the game. And, and Cal State, they were about to kick off. They, they, kick, they were going to do a kickoff. And the, the, the uh, band for Stanford thought the game was over. <laughs> All right? The, the band came out on the field and they were marching and playing their music because they thought the game was over. Cal State receives the ball. <laughs> Off they go down the field. One guy's got the ball. He's running. They, they tackle him. And just before he hits the ground, he passes the ball to his teammate. Boom. Number two. Number two. <laughs> Off he goes down the field. And he's running. And they tackle him, but just before he hits the ground, he passes the ball off to teammate number three. Now the commentator, as he's speaking, his voice is kind of elevating because he thinks, you know, game over. But, but wait a minute, what's going on here? <laughs> and guy number three gets the ball, and off he goes, and they tackle him. But just before he hits the ground, he passes it off to guy number four. The fourth guy gets the ball, he's running, and they tackle him. But just before he falls, he passes it off to guy number five. Six, guy number six. Guy number six takes it into the end zone. <laughs> Beloved, listen, they were all part of the same team. Do you know that Adventists, Adventists are simply Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterian lollards who took a little of all the truth that they had and brought it into one melting pot. That's what we were. One person didn't start the Adventist movement. It was started by Baptists and Methodists and Presbyterians and even Catholics. What other movement has that history? Now, if we were living in today, <laughs> we would be considered a cult. <laughs> in fact, your neighbors might look at you funny. Oh, those Adventists, they eat babies. <laughs> you would have to be bold today in order to say, I'm going to stand up and be a Seventh-day Adventist. As bold, you see, we can look back and pass and say, oh, Luther, Luther would have been with you. Wesley, Wesley, I would have been with you. Well, God says, here's your test now. Here's your test now. You see, beloved, at the, at, at, when 1844 came, uh, uh, the Bible tells us that there is no more time prophecy. In other words, there's no more time on the clock. We are in that final play of earth's history, beloved. There is no fumbling the ball now. The angels are on their feet looking with great anticipation, seeing, are we going to make it into the end time? I mean, the end zone. <laughs> yeah. 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 
And so, beloved, the people of God get this ball and off they go down the field. What with the three angels' messages? Fear God and give glory to Him for the what? Hour of His judgment is come. What is the judgment based upon? It's based upon the law. Do you see, beloved? The judgment message could not go forward until the law was restored. So that's why Jesus says, when this gospel shall be preached in all the world, then shall the end come. You see, beloved, this gospel had been taken away during the Dark Ages, and so it was not until 1844, that when the full gospel was restored, that the gospel message could begin to go forward. Do you want to know something? The only time the word gospel is mentioned in the book of Revelation is in Revelation chapter 14, verse 6 and 7 which is the first angel's message. Wow. It is this gospel that is to go into all the world. And beloved, the truth is a very simple one. The truth is a very simple one. The gospel that is being preached is very simple. It is get into the ark. Okay, you didn't get that. We'll try it again. Get into the ark. <laughs> what ark? The ark of the covenant. That's the ark that we're calling people into, beloved. That's what we're... It's Noah's message. Get in the ark before it's too late. All right. So, so, we need to see this very quickly, beloved. At the same time that truth is being restored on earth, something's happening in heaven. What is that? It's the judgment. What is the judgment about? Who is the judgment for? No. The judgment is for the angels in heaven. You see, beloved, God is trying to invite humanity into the society of heaven. But angels cannot read the human heart. So when God says, so, just imagine with me a person that has lived a life of just total crookedness, and the angels know it, and then on the guy's deathbed, he can't even speak, but in his heart, he says, Lord, forgive me. Forgive me. And God says to the angel, okay, write his name in the book of life. The angel is going like, what? <laughs> okay, I will write it. But I know that one day the books will be opened and you will show all of us why this guy saved. Are you with me? Because only God can read the heart. Now, there is an adversary, and that adversary is who? Satan. See, God is not accusing you. God doesn't have books to try to make sure that you're lost. Like, ha-ha, oh, caught you, you're lost. God is our defender. Satan is the prosecutor. So when Satan says, look, this guy did this, 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 and this, the reason why God has books is because the books contain evidence that you've repented. God can open a book and say, well, according to my books, he repented, and that's why he's saved. Are you with me? God's judgment is not against you. He's not trying to get you lost. He's, he's holding evidence to save you from Satan's accusations. So, by the time this judgment is over, the angels in heaven say, just and true are thy ways, O God. Are you with me? All right, now, meantime, I'm going to leave my slides alone now because I just got to, like, go fast forward. We're going to fast forward, okay? In the meantime, uh, the three angels' messages go forward, and those messages are designed to call up people out of Babylon, to not drink the wine of Babylon, the wine of confusion, which says it's okay to ignore God's law. By the way, the Bible tells us it is not fit for kings to drink wine, lest they drink and forget the law. So that's Proverbs 31, verse 4 and 5. So the reason we know that the second angel's message is directly towards the law of God is because Babylon is trying to give the world this cup that makes them say it's okay to ignore the law of God. And if you have that mentality, you will not be fit for the kingdom of heaven. All right? So the three angels' messages are preached, and then what happens? The plagues fall. Anyone know where the plagues come from? They come from the most holy place. 
Why do you think they come from the most holy place? Why are the seven angels with the seven last plagues seen coming out of the most holy place? It's very simple. Because those who receive the plagues are those who rejected what was found in the most holy place. The law of God. Are you with me? So, the plagues are poured out and Jesus comes. I have to show you this. The Bible says, we which, are, we, we which are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord shall not pre prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. Do you see what article of furniture is right there? The altar of what? Sacrifice. Listen, beloved. Those who died in Christ and died with him are going to be what? Resurrected. That altar right there also points us to the, to the, to the fact that those that die with him will also what? Live with him. The labor, what is the labor about? Purification. Do you realize that no one could enter the temple without first washing? Do you realize that that labor is pointing us to, the, to when we get our new bodies? Our incorruptible bodies? So the altar of sacrifice, those that die in Christ, will be resurrected. The labor, when they are resurrected, they will have purified bodies so that they can enter the kingdom of heaven. Do you know that seven branch candlestick represents the kingdom of heaven? Remember a city set on a hill? How many of you are looking forward to entering the new Jerusalem? Amen. And guess what happens when we enter the new Jerusalem? Like we don't, we don't, this is beautiful. We don't die and then just go straight to heaven. We die, but we must be resurrected and purified. And then we enter the city of God. Even the message of, of the state of the dead can be found in the sanctuary. So we enter the city of God. And then after we enter the city of God, we get to sit at the welcome table. <laughs> <laughs> we get to sit at the welcome table. How many of you looking forward to sitting at the welcome table? Amen. And then after we sit at the welcome table, we're going to spend a thousand years doing what? Jury duty. <laughs> Jury duty. We're going to, listen, what does the altar of incense represent? It represents Christ's what? Intercession. We're going to spend a thousand years reviewing Christ's intercession for the lost. We're going to see how Christ's intercession for the lost, how it was rejected by the lost. Are you with me? And when that 1,000 years is over, what happens? The Bible says, the Bible tells us that the righteous, at the end of that judgment, guess what we're going to say? Like the angels in heaven, we too will now say, just and what? True are thy ways, thou king of saints. Do you see what's happening here? The angels agree with God. Redeemed humanity agrees with God. Okay? Now, 1,000 years passes. Jesus and his saints come back down to earth. The wicked are resurrected. And what happens? They stand before what? What do they stand before? Revelation 20 says, I saw the dead small and great, stand before what? The throne of God. Beloved, we're wrapping our movie up. Where did the movie begin? Before the throne of God. Where does the movie end? There is Satan and the wicked standing before the throne of God. They, the books are now open to them. And as they themselves review the books, guess what they're going to say? Just and true are thy ways, O King of saints. Every knee shall bow, every tongue confess. There will be no, there will be a unanimous decision that God is just. No one in all the universe will say, ah, oh, maybe God. No, they're going to remember that the wicked themselves said, just and true are thy ways, O King of saints. 
You might remember that the Bible says that Lucifer would be destroyed um, from the midst of the stones of fire. Do you know what those stones of fire were? God wrote the law on stones. Deuteronomy tells us that a fiery law went forth from his fingers. The very law that Lucifer broke will destroy him. The wicked are burnt up, they become ashes. Christ makes a new heaven and a new earth. And the Bible says in Isaiah 66, from one Sabbath to another, all flesh will come and worship before me. Why? Because just like Israel celebrated the Sabbath, as a sign of their deliverance from captivity, so we will ever keep the Sabbath in remembrance of our deliverance from this sinful world. Earth's final movie. Beloved, let us not have the wicked say to us in the end of time, you saw this movie and you didn't tell me about it. You told me about all these other movies. You saw this movie. You didn't tell me about this movie. You know when the wicked stand before God, Ellen White says it will be like a panoramic view. This world will turn into the earth's biggest movie theater where everyone will see the part they played. What part will you play in this movie? This is no make-believe movie, beloved. This is reality TV. The Bible says, they that turn many to righteousness shall shine as the stars forever. Do you want to be a star? Yeah. Beloved, the place where stars are born. <laughs> the place where stars are born. It's time to be born again. Beloved, I want to... I, I, I'm f I finished. I really am. The, the, the end credits are rolling. That's what this end credits. You know, starring, starring Jesus. <laughs> Amen. But beloved, God is wanting to use you to help lead others to the way to the throne of God. Do you think? that you can lead them to the throne of God? Yes. God can use you. Yes. He can use you. If it's your desire to be used, I want you to stand to your feet and we're going to pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for showing us Earth's final movie. We thank you for giving us an understanding of the great controversy and how it all unfolds and how it all begins and ends before your throne. Please, Lord, help us to watch this movie again and again. Help us to hang the pictures in memory's hall that we may easily be able to share it with those around us. Make us stars, Lord. Make us stars. In Earth's final movie is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. You may be seated.